seminar for today will be about kin selection and thinking about Hamilton's rule, which came from, it was now having our 50th anniversary for thinking about how uh, benefits of cooperating with genetic relatives might actually um, favor the evolution of various forms of social behavior. So the work that I'm presenting today is basically approaching this problem using a couple different um, studies and just it's setting the stage as the PowerPoint is loading. And basically we're at this 50 year anniversary, so it's this great opportunity to evaluate the uh, theory that is explaining doing a security scan and it's part way through. There we go. Ah, there we are. Okay. Is it possible to turn the light on just the top layer? Yeah, start with Yeah, no worries. Um, okay, so Hamilton's legacy, thinking about kinship, cooperation, and social tolerance. And as James pointed out, I do work on a variety of uh, furry animals. The common theme here is cooperative animals, animals that will engage in social interactions with each other. And the evolution of cooperation is a really strange thing from an evolutionary standpoint. So there's this puzzle uh, because it's not clear why animals should cooperate with each other because if you think about it, if you are taking time out from your daily activity to help another individual, you're foregoing your own reproduction to help out another animal that might actually pass on its genes. So about 50 years ago, um, W.D. Hamilton proposed a novel theory for explaining the evolution of cooperation. And that's what I'll be grappling with today. Where are we over this 50 years? How much progress have we made? How much support do we see for this? And here's the original paper. Who's read this paper? Anyone? Seen it? <laughs> seen it, sniffed it. Um, it's a very well-cited paper, both in evolutionary and behavioral ecology uh, circles. And basically, this paper is fundamental in thinking about the evolution of cooperation, so how genes are being passed on. and Basically, my goal is to evaluate this um, proposal that inclusive fitness will propel social evolution. And I'll define inclusive fitness. Um, and there's W.D. Hamilton. So inclusive fitness is basically a combination of direct fitness, where an individual might pass on their genes directly through reproduction, right? And in addition to that, they may indirectly pass on their genes through their shared genetic relatives doing well and producing more offspring. So classic examples of um, evidence for inclusive fitness theory come from social insects, cooperative breeding birds, and of course my favorite, the naked mole rat queen here. So that's why she has her little queen um, tiara or crown, as it was, as it would be. And there's a lot of evidence for cooperation in the, with respect to cooperative breeding. And I'm going to suggest that it's pretty straightforward, although of course it's not always that easy, to quantify the costs and benefits with respect to cooperative breeding. So helping someone else rear their offspring that are not directly yours. And the Hamilton's rule, which is one of the fundamental aspects of this uh, foundational paper, basically says that individuals should benefit from cooperating when the benefits of helping times the genetic relatedness to the individual they're helping overwhelm the costs of doing so. Okay? And what I'm suggesting is that it's fairly straightforward when you're thinking about number of offspring coming out. So number of ants for number of um, birds that are born from cooperative breeding. So number of progeny, that's a fairly straightforward measure. Um, and in contrast to that, individuals that I study typically engage in really short-term social acts. So I might come up to you and give you a cookie, and maybe you give me one later, or something like that. How do I really quantify that with respect to my lifetime reproductive success? 
So it's really challenging for these short-term behaviors such as grooming, uh, being in proximity. Um, you know, if you have dogs at home, you see these social interactions that they engage in. And those are really the subject of my work. And I'm asking how well does Hamilton's rule um, support this cooperative behavior, taking time out to help someone else. Okay. And there's a variety of growing literature on all of these animals that are shown here uh, that actually these long-term social relationships directly influence an individual's fitness. So in each of these animals here, having these long-term social bonds, the summation of these helpful behaviors across a lifetime actually increases their reproductive success through maybe survival of offspring. Uh, they also can live longer, such as these little hyraxes here. So living in a group can potentially be really, really helpful um, if you look at these long-term patterns. Okay? So this is the stepping off point, and none of these data were available 50 years ago when this original idea of kid selection was proposed. And one of the reasons that we're able to actually figure some of this out is we collect things such as, in my lab right now with California ground squirrels over at Mills College, we're collecting feces from squirrels. We're able to actually um, tell a lot about an animal based on these non-invasive or relatively non-invasive measures. And you can do feces, you can do hair, blood as well. And from these measures, we can actually extract DNA. And from, so these are free-living animals. You go out, you collect some samples. Actually, we're using the feces for hormone analysis in my lab, and the hair and blood will be what we use for genetic analysis. Uh, but anyway, the idea is to extract DNA and assign parentage. And it's really important to be able to assign both mom and dad, because from the kin selection um, hypothesis, it's levels of relatedness. So the proportion of genes that we share. It doesn't matter if they come from dad or from mom. The theory predicts that they should both be important in favoring a cooperative behavior. So once we assign parentage, then various workers in the field of evolutionary ecology are able to come up with pedigrees, these fully resolved pedigrees. And if you've never seen a pedigree before, you can think of uh, dog pedigrees, also your own family tree as well. So these are relationships, and when they're fully resolved like this, it's really helpful in slipping them into this equation to think about relatedness and how it predicts social behavior. So just to drive this po point home, um, here's an incomplete list of a variety of different species for which pedigrees currently exist. And you can see there are a variety of rodents and lagomorphs, and these are the sample size of individuals. So some pedigrees are much larger than others, uh, but there's really getting to be this large list of species for which we know um, who mom is, who dad is, and who paternal and maternal kin are. And uh, ungulates, including elephants, sheep, horses, a variety of carnivores, um, cetaceans, and primates. And what I'm going to focus on today are two long-term studies that I've had the opportunity to work on. And I'm going to just highlight these guys, so probably saw from the cover slide, I've uh, worked on both yellow-bellied marmots, this is out in the Rocky Mountains in Colorado, for my postdoc at UCLA, and then my dissertation research was based on this long-term data set in Kenya on spotted hyenas. So I'm going to use these two data sets to address this question of how well kin selection theory stands up in the field. <coughs> 